in the 2010 Home Office Drug Strategy Forward. Theresa May claimed that drug use is a key cause of societal harm. She argued that it causes misery and pain to individuals, destroys families and undermines communities. She states that liberalisation or decriminalisation fail to recognise the complexity of the problem and gives insufficient regard to the harms that drugs pose to the individual, their families and the wider community. This report will investigate the claims used by politicians with a view to pointing out that it is prohibition itself, not dependency, that is the key cause of societal harm. And it is prohibitionist policies that fail to recognise the complexity of the issue. God If at first you don't succeed, try, try again, and then give up. Don't be a damn fool about it. W.C. Fields' wisecrack contained a lot of wisdom. Nowhere does it apply more than in the crusade against drugs. Drug raids are good politics, but they don't make a dent in the problem. The federal government seizure of cocaine are six times what they were just a few years ago. But the flood of cocaine into the country has continued to be so massive as to drive down the price. A variety of drugs are for sale within a mile of the Drug Enforcement Administration's headquarters. The ban on drugs has become prohibition writ large. Like prohibition, the ban on drugs has been a financial bonanza for organized crime, and its profits have financed the corruption of law enforcement agencies, politicians, and judges. Drugs can be hideous things and those who push drugs are slimy and poisonous. But let us not forget that a similar case was made against alcohol and bootleggers many years ago. Tens of thousands of lives are still lost each year to drunk driving alone. That doesn't count the other lives destroyed or dehumanized under the influence of the bottle. If drugs and alcohol had never been discovered, this would be a lot better world. But it is a dangerous illusion that we have the omnipotence to undo every evil. The crusading mentality can easily make things worse. Drugs are inherently a problem for the individual who takes them, but they are a much bigger problem for society precisely because they are illegal. It is their illegality that makes them costly and drives people to desperation to get the money by any means at anybody else's expense. The mere cost of production of drugs can be very inexpensive. If an addict could support his addiction for a few dollars a week, he would still be an addict, but he would not have to steal, mug, or kill other people to support his habit. Neither would drug pushers have the financial incentive to try to get children hooked on drugs if there was no big money in it. Crusaders cannot accept the fact that they are not God that they have neither the right nor the competence to run other people's lives. The years that preceded prohibition saw private citizens take the law into their own hands, entering saloons with axes to destroy bottles of liquor. It was ego-boosting, moral exhibitionism. When the Crusaders finally succeeded in getting the prohibition amendment added to the U.S. Constitution, it was their crowning triumph and the nation's tragedy. Organized crime blossomed so did the corruption of the whole political process. When national prohibition ended, many localities passed their own bans on liquor. Bootleggers sometimes financed the campaigns to ban liquor. Their profits depended on liquors being illegal. Legalization of narcotics would similarly destroy the profits of today's drug pushers. There is no way that they can compete with drugs that can be mass-produced cheaply by big pharmaceutical companies. This is not a complete solution. Nowhere is it written in stone that there are always answers in the back of the book. What we can do as a society is to cut our losses. It is bad enough that some people destroy their own lives with drugs. We don't need to add vast numbers of innocent victims who are robbed, mugged, or murdered by addicts trying to get money for a fix. Like alcohol, drugs can be regulated for content, age required for purchasing, 
driving under the influence, etc. But this is just one more area where we have to recognize that government has its limits. Ignoring those limits is not only reckless arrogance, but dangerous. We finally learned that painful lesson from prohibition. We need to remember it when it comes to drugs. The UK's chief drugs advisor, Professor David Nutt, has been sacked by the Home Secretary, Alan Johnson, following his criticism of the decision to reclassify cannabis. Alan Johnson said Professor Nutt's behavior ran contrary to his responsibilities. Well, Professor Nutt joins me now. Do you think that is the reason you were sacked? Well, it all goes back, I think, to um, when Gordon Brown took office. Uh, until then, the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs had made multiple recommendations over 40 years, uh, and every one of them had been accepted by the government. Uh, and Gordon comes in and Gordon says, cannabis should be class B. Uh, because it's a lethal drug, especially in the form of skunk. Now that is a politician getting science very, very wrong. And from that point on, I think the relationships between the, my council and the government began to unravel. Well, let me be clear that we are just classifying uh, cannabis again to show very clearly, particularly to the young people who fall prey to people selling cannabis, uh, that it is an illegal and a harmful drug, and it could lead to people taking more dangerous drugs as a result of taking cannabis. Its greatest danger lies in the fact that it is a stepping stone to the harder drugs, such as morphine and heroin. That's why there are people who want to legalize marijuana. They figure if they can get the young people of this country onto hard drugs, they can destroy your generation, or in this generation. You know, in the days of Harry Anslinger, it was called uh, the stepping stone hypothesis. If you stepped on this stone, marijuana, you were bound and determined to go on to the next stone, which would be one of the so-called hard drugs. Every time it's been studied and looked at and so on, they have never, ever found that there's certainly nothing in marijuana that makes you want to go to anything else. There is no inherent psychopharmacological property of the drug which pushes one toward another drug. I'll smoke a joint. I want a bag of chips and fucking junk food. I don't want to go out and get ripped. I drink alcohol. That's my drug of choice. It could be said I started on milk. I mean, this is crazy. If I use marijuana, why does that automatically make me a candidate to black tar heroin? It's a nonsensical argument. The black market throws the, the dealers of soft drugs together with the dealer of hard drugs. So if you have a black market, and you have a dealer that's dealing in marijuana and LSD and everything else, and the dealer might say to you, hey, you want to try something stronger? Well, in that sense, because of the black market, because of prohibition, people may be more susceptible to seeing these other drugs and being willing to try these other drugs. And so what you see is that there is a gateway effect, uh, but it's a gateway effect caused by prohibition and the blending of the hard and soft drug markets. Uh, and so we are absolutely determined to, uh, to tell young people uh, that uh, cannabis is unacceptable, it is unlawful, but it is also harmful. We know that there are harmful side effects of alcohol as well, but the important thing here is that we give people the best advice possible. On January 16, 1920, the great American bender came to an end when the Volstead Act was signed into law and became the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. So began the great Prohibition era, brought on in part by a decades-old grassroots temperance campaign organized largely by women that had already succeeded in banning liquor in 25 states. Now the entire country would go dry. Everywhere, law enforcement officials set about enforcing prohibition by tracking down stills and stashes and disposing of them. Throughout the country, raids were made on bootleggers' hideouts and cask after cask of bathtub gin were hacked open by eager police. Unfortunately, prohibition had many unintended consequences. For one thing, it divided the country between dries and wets, those who supported or opposed the 18th Amendment. 
For another, crime soared as people turned to bootleggers to obtain their liquor. Supplying alcohol to a thirsty populace soon became the province of organized criminal syndicates, led by some of the most notorious figures in American history. The problems with legislating morality soon became abundantly clear as underground drinking spots, speakeasies, flourished as millions of Americans evaded prohibition and continued to party like never before. The glamour of the speakeasies proved a powerful attraction and later research showed that more people drank during the 1920s than before prohibition. Alcohol-related deaths increased substantially. In New York City alone, 700 people died in 1927 as opposed to only 84 in 1920. Along the coast, rum fleets took to the sea to run booze past Coast Guard patrols and the rest of the Prohibition Navy, which was allowed to shoot first and ask questions later. The bootleggers and organized syndicates armed themselves and operated sophisticated networks. Some, such as crime lord Al Capone, made tremendous fortunes during Prohibition. In one three-year period, illegal alcohol sales topped $15 million. Around the nation, local district attorneys struggled with a glut of prohibition cases, which sometimes took up over 50% of their time. Law enforcement was costing the country millions. Franklin Roosevelt campaigned against prohibition during the 1932 election, and it was a stance that helped propel him to the White House. Finally, in December of 1933, the United States admitted failure and repealed the Volstead Act. Prohibition, with all its lofty moral goals, had at last come to an end. So you can say X is more dangerous than Y, and so, but it's up to the politicians to decide what then to do with it. Haven't you overstepped the mark? Well, no, the way, the way the Misuse of Drugs Act is supposed to work is that we are supposed to estimate the harms of drugs. And we are then supposed to tell government what we think the harms are and uh, recommend to them where the drug should be classified in the act. It shouldn't be the other way around. The politicians shouldn't say to us, uh, we think cannabis is class B or ecstasy is class A. Go away and find the evidence to support us. That's quite wrong. Why is marijuana illegal when alcohol and tobacco are more addictive and dangerous to our health, but we manage to control them? Would an education about drugs from a younger age be better? Well, there's one bit of that question I agree with, which I think education about drugs is vital, and we should make sure that education programs are there in our schools, and we should make sure that they work. But I don't really accept the rest of the question. I think if you actually look at the sort of marijuana that is on sale today, it is actually incredibly uh, damaging, very, very toxic, and leads to, in many cases, huge mental health problems. Herb. Herb is a plant. I mean, herbs are good for everything. Why, why these people want to do so much good for everyone who call themselves governments and this and that? Why them say you must not use the herb? You see? And we take that and we can't find, we just see them just say, no, you must use it, you must use it because it make you rebel. Against what? Against men who crave because them crave for the things like several them. Them have some material things and them want to captivate your mind and tell you, say, well, you have to work and put your pension and him keep it high. So herb make you look for yourself and instead of you want to work for the man, you want you want you want for you want for be one of the man to so not in the sense of how he is, but in the sense of why should you have to bow to these things. You reach in a sense where you you you're strong enough can take a little smoke. So when all them cara pass. Although you live in a city, you don't hear it because you're thinking. Differently if you just live so. Then, you know what I mean? You, the whole world confuses you and you're worried and you don't have no time to think. And herb, herb is a thing that gives you a little time for yourself so you can live. If you use it. 
Alcohol make you drunk, man. You don't make you meditate. It just make you drunk. When you drink alcohol, you don't meditate. You more meditated. Herb is more a consciousness. This is the people who make it out loud. Like it's about a few. Majority of the people from the hurt want it. And it's just a few because guns and prisons and bad life treat you bad. So people kinda. But we want some people power. And the only people power is Rastafari. But I think the more fundamental reason uh, for not uh, making these drugs legal is that to make them legal would make them even more prevalent and would increase use levels even more than they are now. So I don't think it is the right answer. I think a combination of education and also treatment programs for drug addicts, I think those are the two most important planks of a proper anti-drug policy. What would happen if you effectively legalized the use of hard drugs such as heroin? Eight years ago in Portugal, the law was changed so that possessing or using any illicit drug was no longer a crime. At the time, there were warnings the policy would be disastrous and that the country would become a European haven for drugs tourism. So, what's actually happened? The BBC's Mark Easton has been in Lisbon, finding out. At the end of the world, I went to see Maria. This area near Lisbon gained its name and reputation from illegal drugs. But over the past eight years, residents have seen a remarkable change. This woman is smoking heroin. In most of the world it's a crime, but here in Portugal there's no way she'd be sent to prison for it. Because in July 2001, Portugal decreed that the purchase, possession and use of any previously illegal substance would no longer be a criminal offence. Many predicted disaster, that plane loads of drug tourists would descend on Portugal knowing they wouldn't end up in court. But what one politician at the time called the promise of sun, beaches and any drug you like simply didn't materialise. In fact, since decriminalisation, the consumption of drugs here in Portugal has gone down. These heroin addicts are among tens of thousands of drug users now in treatment in Portugal. Drug deaths here have fallen, drug-related infections are down, and official figures show overall drug consumption is down 10%. The apocalypse never came. We don't know if it's the change in the law or whether it's because Amy Winehouse and Pete Doherty are in the news again. We don't know what stops people taking drugs, but we can see what hasn't happened. And what hasn't happened is that there hasn't been an explosion in drug use as you might expect. But when you say things like in the Guardian newspaper today, if you think scaring kids will stop them using, you're probably wrong. And that's going way beyond your job, isn't it? Well, my goal in life is to reduce the harms from drug use. I believe that the best way of doing that is to have a fully scientifically founded Misuse of Drugs Act, which means telling people the truth about drugs. If you pretend that you can lie to kids who know considerably more about drugs than most politicians, all you're doing is demeaning yourself and undermining any sensible message. But the argument that it could be used as medicinal properties, that was another question we actually had, a person saying it's got proven medicinal properties. If used properly and regulated properly, it could actually be quite helpful. Hello, Mr. David Cameron. My name is Cain Derrick. With the 1974 Virginia study, 2007 Harvard study and 2009 Madrid study all showing that the active compounds in marijuana shrink and destroy tumorous and cancerous cells with no toxic side effects, when do you think it's a good time to start medicalizing marijuana and saving lives? That is a matter for the science and the medical authorities to determine. We know what the harms are. Politicians don't know what the harms are. They're free to make uh, independent determinations about that. The government's chief advisor on drugs policy has been sacked after insisting that alcohol and cigarettes are more dangerous than cannabis and ecstasy. But the question here about whether illegal drugs should be made legal, my answer is no. OK, then. And there's a danger to you on what you do with your own body. Yeah, you know, I made a comment once in a speech on the House floor. I said, yes. Some of the strongest drug warriors in Washington, D.C. rant and rave about the possibility of a sick person using marijuana for their illness at the same time. But guess what? 
They have no hesitation to imbibe in that drug called alcohol, a more dangerous drug. What has happened today has actually considerably undermined the confidence of scientists in, in government and really dug away at the huge amount of work. I mean, I have spent 10 years working for government in this area, N unpaid, totally unpaid. So have me many of my council have worked for longer, and then they see that the, the, their work is devalued by these relatively simple sort of political uh, decisions. Well, I don't accept that this um, drug uh, isn't dangerous. We have seen cases where uh, young people have actually died from it. I think what's important is, yes, of course you must have the advisory council on the misuse of drugs, the experts giving you the advice, but in the end, ministers have to decide on the basis of harm to the public and on the basis of making a decision and then defending it in Parliament. And I think that is the right way to do it. On the issue of drugs, which is a really important issue, we're losing the battle uh, on drugs. And one of the reasons is because drugs policy has been hijacked by um, scaremongering and populism. Not just in the press, but also from a succession of Home Secretaries who have felt that the, the way to get uh, to win the battle of and the war on drugs is just to talk tough on them. Actually, what you need is, I think, to make sure that the, um, the, ad the advisory panel on the misuse of drugs, which is the expert panel, which is supposed to be providing advice to the government on how to tackle drugs and to tackle drugs abuse, should be put on an entirely independent statutory basis so that experts, once again, uh, lead this debate. Not populism, not scaremongering, and not the, 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 the whims and wishes of, of one Home Secretary after the next. My analysis is that legalization would reduce crime, first because a lot of violence that is associated with drug markets arises because those markets are underground, because they're prohibited, so the participants can't use the standard legal system to resolve their disputes, and they resort to violence instead. There's also the possibility of some reduction in other types of crime, such as income generating crime, because with lower prices for legal drugs, people would have less incentive to steal or engage in prostitution or things like that in order to support their drug habits. I think it would probably reduce the demand for guns by reducing the amount of violence. With less violence, fewer people are worried about their safety or worried about self-defense, and therefore they would have less incentive to want to purchase guns for self-defense. In a legal market, Drugs would be much cheaper, so people would have less incentive to inject. They could consume them in other manner, mechanisms that are not as cost-effective, but still would give you a reasonable bang for the buck if drugs were inexpensive. And in a legal market, uh, people would be able to buy legal syringes legally, so they'd be much less likely to want to share them in the first place. And manufacture drugs would try to market them in ways that were relatively healthy. Legalization would enhance respect for the law because uh, people would not be routinely violating laws, uh, doing something that they do not regard and many people do not regard as really serious offenses. We want people to respect the law and in some cases we know that despite our best intentions there will be violations such as the laws against murder. But almost everyone agrees that murder is wrong and should be punished and should be stopped in most instances. With the use of various drugs, a huge number of people don't see any great harm done to either the user or to other people from the use of drugs and therefore they tend to look the other way at violations. So we now have a situation where millions of people every day are violating the law. That just tends to teach people that laws are for suckers and they should violate those laws that are inconvenient when they can get away with it rather than taking the attitude of as long as the law is in place I will obey it and only change my behavior if I can change the law. We would shrink the deficit simply because we would stop spending all the money we're spending locking people up, prosecuting people for drug crimes, arresting people for drug crimes, and at the same time, we would tax the income that's generated in the drug market. Um, even if we tax drugs at rates similar to all other goods, we would collect billions of dollars uh, in tax revenue, and if we tax them at rates similar to those on, say, alcohol and tobacco, we would probably collect tens of billions of dollars in tax revenue every year. So the deficit would certainly go down because of lower expenditure and higher tax revenues. If this state were to in fact make marijuana no longer illegal for adults, that is not at all the same thing as condoning it. We don't condone the smoking of cigarettes or the using of alcohol, etc. So to put that label on it, I think is inappropriate. 
Number two, as I have an understanding that today, as we speak, that there are thousands of people in prison for doing nothing but smoking marijuana. Thousands in prison for doing nothing but smoking marijuana. Why? Because they're on parole for one reason or another. And once they get off parole for whatever that offense was, if they smoke marijuana, they are, it's a violation of parole, and they're immediately put back into state prison with all of the benefits that uh, they had accrued, getting jobs, etc., supporting their families, being lost. Another one is that the tougher we get with regard to marijuana prosecution, literally, from my experience as a judge, and I have seen this, the softer we get with the prosecution of everything else. And that is something that we simply have so many resources, and if we're spending them in prosecutions of marijuana, we are not spending them for prosecutions of rape, homicide, etc. Marijuana will never put this violence that we heard earlier out of business. All of these statistics that you heard earlier about the violence and the killings of both the police officers and everyone else is occurring under today's system of marijuana prohibition, etc. The only way you put these Mexican cartels out of business and these other violent creatures out of business is to undercut the price, to make it no longer illegal so that you don't have that enormous profit motive to get these people involved with that violence, etc. The only way you do it is to undercut the price. Otherwise, there are marijuana today that is stronger in our society, without a doubt. But the reason why it's out there and stronger is because of marijuana prohibition. That there are lots of people who would much prefer not to use the stronger stuff, but the cardinal rule of prohibition is always push the stronger stuff. So if I'm a bootlegger and I run into the same criminal justice problems for selling a barrel of beer as a barrel of bourbon, guess which one I'm going to push? The bourbon because I make more money. It's the same thing with marijuana. Nothing is going to be legalized in this state. It is a program of the strictly regulated distribution. It wouldn't be legalized. It's a strictly regulated distribution, just like alcohol and, and uh, cigarettes put into your legislation, not to allow this to be advertised. We want to de-glamorize it, not glamorize it. Winston's got that built up plan. The year for it. tastes good like a cigarette should. So no advertising and hold people accountable for their actions. Today, our marijuana laws are putting our children in harm's way. We are continuing with this failed program for all of its defects, so-called, because we want to reduce the exposure of a lifestyle of marijuana usage and marijuana selling to our children. And it's doing the opposite. Today, it is easier for our young people to get marijuana than it is alcohol. And if you don't want to listen to me, ask any teenagers you can find. They will tell you that because of prohibition, because the illegal dealers do not ask for ID. So let's make it less available for children by regulating and controlling it. Number two, adult drug dealers will recruit children to sell drugs. They will recruit them to their, into their own drug distribution system for fifty dollars in cash you can buy all of the fifteen sixteen year olds in the inner city or anywhere else that you want to it's chump change for the adult drug dealer it's lots of money for a kid so you use them as gophers and lookouts and couriers and as soon as their reliability is established then they're trusted to sell small amounts of drugs out in the communities and who do they sell to if they're out there doing it i assure you no one in this room they're going to sell to their fourteen fifteen sixteen year old peers that is despicable and it's caused by drug prohibition so I say, let's reverse that, let's turn it around, let's regulate it, let's control it, because this prohibition is not working. state against prohibition is happy news for the grain raisers of the United States and for many others throughout the land. With an eye on December 5th, 
Work is being rushed in distilleries and bottling works. Thousands are being called back to work in plants of allied industries. At least 500,000 new jobs are predicted as a result of repeal. From keg and barrel factories, perhaps the most closely allied line, immediate benefits from repeal extend into almost every line of business and commerce. However, everyone's not waiting until December 15th. The lid is off in many places, with the downfall of prohibition being celebrated in real old-time hilarity.